Welcome to the Cloud Pod, where the forecast is always cloudy. We talk weekly about all things AWS, GCP, and Azure. We are your hosts, Justin, Jonathan, Ryan, and Peter. Episode 203, recorded for March 8th, 2023. From vaporware to visual apps, AWS App Composer finally, generally available. Yay. Hey, Peter. Or sorry, no, Peter. Hey, Jonathan. Hey, Ryan. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Justin. I'm back. I'm back. You guys did a good job last week. I listened to the show. Uh, nicely done. Thank you. You've yeah. even uh, even stumbled through my show notes, which I know has been a complaint in the past that when I read the show notes, it's fine. But when you try to read my show notes, it's a bit of a difficult problem. <laughs> so because I also don't actually read everything I put in my show notes, I just kind of yeah. use it as a guide, which you find out the hard way. So <laughs> you, guys did, uh, you guys did fine. Yeah, <laughs> but, this is, there's a lesson learned there for, for uh, PowerPoint presentations and things. All right. mm-hmm. Mm. But uh, yeah, so overall it was good. I uh, it got published, and uh, hopefully people listen to it. But uh, I uh, I was a little bit disappointed you guys skipped the migration journey for that episode because that's the this is the one I don't want to talk about today. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, uh-huh. those, those yeah. punks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we we kind of had a time crunch in the end, but honestly, we didn't want to talk about it either. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, well, then uh, you're looking forward to that, listeners. You look forward to that at the end of the show. So, all right, well, let's get to it. Uh, we got a bunch of stuff to get to. So, uh, AWS has announced that they are working on a new region in Malaysia. This will allow all Malaysian customers, of course, to host their data locally. But we have three new AZs uh, in the region, bringing the total up to 99 when it comes online, although they, they don't mention when it'll be online, but probably like end of 2024, beginning of 2025 is my guess. Uh, and Amazon is apparently committed to spending over $6 billion in Malaysia by 2037. So, uh, yeah, if you are in that part of the world uh, and you need AWS, uh, you will soon be able to get it. Maybe they can use it to help find that plane that's still missing. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. For, for for once, I actually went into some detail about the customers in the area and why they're really in that area. It's usually, it's kind of like we're opening a new region. Uh, there you go. Actually, Amazon's always good about that. They, you know, they do... Where G- GCP and Azure don't mention any customers when they do this, but uh, Amazon's always actually been pretty good about giving you kind of an idea of some of the customers um, who are going to be there. And, and you know, part of the thing is, I imagine there's a, a sunk cost uh, or floor to what you need to have in revenue in a region. <laughs> and so I suspect that they had to go figure out who would move their workloads to their new region if they were to build one. Uh, versus Google and Oracle, who are just like just build it and they will come. Uh, Amazon's only building it because they're already there. <laughs> so yeah, or or they're just not advertising the same the level of effort because I can't imagine that the amount of investment it takes to, to build out something like that with all the not only just you know the the compute and all that stuff, but then all the infrastructure to to maintain it. And yep, it's a big deal. I'm sure, it's not a huge population in Malaysia. I think it's like thirty million or just over thirty million. But it looks like all the customers or most of the customers are finance and, and government and education and sort of let's sort of core infrastructure type things, which makes sense for a, I guess a, a fairly still developing nation, economically wise. Yeah. Well, the application composer, which was announced at reInvent, is now generally available. App Composer is a visual builder for you to compose and configure serverless applications from AWS services backed by deployment-ready infrastructure as code or infrastructure as code. I'd like to point out that they said visual builder for you to compose and do not use the word no code or low code because uh, clearly they listen to the show and they know yeah. that we don't like it. <laughs> and so they've, they've artfully removed that from the press release. Yeah. Uh, with two days uh, general availability of it, they're also having several new features, including the ability to connect an Amazon API gateway directly to Amazon SQS without routing through Lambda functions and a new change inspector capability, which provides a visual diff of template changes made when you connect two resources on the canvas, which is the pretty picture you draw to connect your things together in a low-code way. <laughs> so uh, I actually going to play with this for the next feature we'll talk about, but uh, I was kind of excited to go. I'm going to play with it next couple weeks. It's my on my list. I like that it's not branded as no code though, because it, it really is no code. It is just hooking together different different services, and there may be data transformations, which is a configuration, and it may be pipelines between different places, and that's a configuration. There isn't there isn't really code involved in this. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Hopefully it's just maturity in that space, right? Like it's it's not a buzzword. It's not the thing, you know, it's not a WYSIWYG workflow type thing that requires a whole bunch, you know, has a whole bunch of rough edges and makes it really difficult to implement. So I like it. Yeah, I agree. 
Well, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm looking forward to using it on this new capability, which is that you can now subscribe to AWS daily feature updates via Amazon SNS topic, uh, which, thank goodness, like I've asked for this for years. Uh, subscribing to the SNS topic will send you a normal email formatted uh, daily message that includes anything they announced or updated in the last day. And then they give you a JSON representation of all that data as well, so you can parse it. Uh, those then link, of course, to the blog posts, uh, as well as to the larger news blog posts, posted like Jeff Barr, etc. Uh, and ultimately, all I have to say is, um, I have subscribed to this. It's very noisy. Uh, please don't unsubscribe from the podcast and <laughs> subscribe to this instead, because you will be inundated with emails. Uh, but uh, I look forward to using this to inject those stories into our show notes, so then I can then edit them more effectively there. Without having to do a copy-paste operation I do right now. Uh, Ryan promised me two years ago when I added him to the podcast that he hasn't delivered, but <laughs> you know, not, not bitter at all. No, no. Uh, what's funny is I, I did the same thing when I saw the application composer. I'm like, oh, I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the two of us will, will try application composer for this use case yeah. sometime in the next two weeks, probably. But, uh, probably likely be neither of us, to be yeah. honest. There's so much to do. <laughs> but uh, we at least have a dream. Yeah. Is it better than having an email sent to every one of 300 Amazon accounts every time there's a product release? Oh, I think yes. it probably it is. Yes, yes. yes. it's much it better. Is. It is better yes. because I can filter that, but much easier. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I can just see a whole bunch of use cases for this. I mean, you could proactively go out and enable services or disable services or do all kinds of interesting things. There's mm-hmm. always been a criticism about, around you know, managed, read, managed read-only policies mm-hmm. where they add a new service or and any managed policies where a new service gets added and all of a sudden you've got admin rights over something that you didn't even know existed yesterday. Mm-hmm. So this, this would be kind of good if, if, the, yeah. if there's enough information in the, in the payload at least to mm-hmm. go off and sort of proactively either alert someone in security or, or in the CCOA or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so like for the rule updates, the fact that they do get into some more of the the details in the at least what I've seen in the last few I've seen this week, but um, you know it, it's just nice that they put it into JSON format because you know that there's a standardized schema format behind any blog, <laughs> and so you know like the way that I do show notes is I copy the URL, then I copy the title of the show, and I update the URL in the Google Doc to be the URL name. You know, it's just like there's a three step process, but like I'm like always known it's, it's just JSON. But then the problem with automating it that Ryan and I quickly discovered when we tried to do it is that you have to then parse the you have to parse the website to or the RSS feed to then get it into a format that isn't XML because that's the problem with RSS. It's all XML. And who wants to deal with that noise? Um, <laughs> you know, you then had to you know, work it through this process, and so either scraping it or working through the XML parser to then convert it to a JSON object to actually do anything with it. Uh, became very complicated very quickly. And then, of course, the Amazon articles in general are not consistent in how they are designed or named or anything else. And so you ran into all these kind of problems that uh, were just kind of awful. And if you've ever seen Corey Quinn, he's got a whole workflow for how he does this newsletter that is basically dealing with the same problem. And I don't want to repeat what Corey built because it gives me a headache every time I see it. <laughs> We post about it if on I Twitter. was younger and had you know more attention span, I think maybe, but yeah, because it, it's impressive, but it's it's a lot, and then you have to factor in the complexity and the maintenance of that over time. Yeah, well, and then, you, then you realize, you know, I was at a company once, and they had an XML to JSON conversion thing they bought from Oracle as the only feature, and I always thought, well, that's ridiculously amount of you know spending a lot of money for this basic feature, and now having tried to do it, I'm like, oh, I see why you would like this feature. Mm-hmm. This makes sense to me. Yeah. They are, they are not compatible. <laughs> yeah, they are not. It was the consistency that it would killed me because I, you know, like, and that's really, I don't even know if the tool would provide that ability. Yeah. Yeah. As, as somebody who's built probably just like hundreds of other people did, things like automated email responses to ACM notifications and things, mm-hmm. having that, having the format of the email change was such a pain. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, having a, having a fixed schema for something, it's great. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's move to GCP. Uh, they are apparently launching several new capabilities to Spanner's regional and multi-regional capabilities. Uh, the first one is the configurable read-only replicas that let you add read-only replicas to any regional or multi-regional Spanner instance to deliver low latency reads to clients in any geography. Apparently, you couldn't just add these before. It's hmm. Surprising. Yeah. Spanner zero down... Well, not really. I know Google now. Uh, Spanner zero downtime instance move service gives you the freedom to move your production Spanner instances from any configuration to any other on the fly with zero downtime whether it's regional, multi-regional, or custom configuration with the configurable read-only replicas. And then they're also dropping the list prices of their of their nine replica global multi-regional configuration, uh, NAM-EUR-Asia1 and Asia3, to make them even more affordable for global workloads. I think that's one of the surprises 
when you get into GCP, um, especially coming from AWS where everything's, you know, region isolated. Like a lot of the GCP differential is that global offering of things like Spanner and, and the network. And, and it's interesting to me how they, they kind of, it's very specialized in, t- in certain things. Like you can you can do a global network between these regions, you know, type of things. And it's those rough edges that you get that you only really find out through implementation. That's really the the sticking point. And so these features, you know, that clearly they're listening to their customers, and this has probably been really painful for a lot of those a lot of those customers. So good. How's that for Google this week? Not much going on there, wow. but. Azure is bringing the Renaissance back in a big way. Cue the uh, cue the music. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like there's a jaunty theme here. Yeah, jaunty theme. <laughs> Announcing a Renaissance in computer vision with AI with Microsoft's Florence Foundation model. Uh, apparently, this was trained with billions of text images pairs and integrated as cost-effective production-ready computer vision service in the Azure Cognitive Service for Vision. Apparently, this will allow developers to create cutting-edge, market-ready, responsible computer vision applications across various industries. Customers can now seamlessly digitize, analyze, and connect their data to natural language interactions, unlocking power insights from their image and video content to support accessibility, drive acquisition through SEO, protect users from harmful content, and enhance security. Uh, They're leveraging this new Vision AI service in Microsoft 365 right now, and things like Teams, PowerPoint, Outlook, Word, Designer, and OneDrive. Out-of-the-box features include dense captions, image retrieval, background removal, model customization, and video summarization. All for you. Uh, and all I can think of is uh, the startup uh, TV show, Silicon Valley, uh, where they had not hot dog <laughs> as, a, <laughs> as a capability of machine learning vision, uh, has now been usurped with the new Florence Foundation model. I think this is great for accessibility. I have a friend who is legally blind and talking to her about her experience of using the web, which she has to do for a job, is, um, is horrendous. Like even, even now, almost 30 years post, you know, the web being a thing, images aren't captioned, things aren't captioned, things aren't accessible. And so even even just something as simple as describing an image that's on a page, which could be critical to, you know, the context of an article that they're reading or something, is is super useful. Great. And then the last Azure story for the week, Azure WAF Guided Investigation Notebooks, just rolls up the tongues, uh, is now using Micro Sentinel for automated false positive tuning. Uh, you guides you uh, the notebook guides you through the investigative experience to understand the Azure WAF incidents in Microsoft Sentinel, identify false positives that require investigation, and create Azure WAF exclusions. It's one of those stories that I think I really only understand the details by actually walking through, you know, a, an example or a, maybe a guided lab. Like there's, I, 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 you know, I've worked with WAF and. and and I, I kind of know the things that they're talking about, but like the, the the notebook and the guided investigation experience, I'm like, I don't what. This is either going to be like, you know, read the docs or 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 I don't know really. Like it's weird. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I, I mean, I guess it just gives gives a person in in the case that a, a transaction was was denied by the WAF that shouldn't have been. It gives a person the opportunity to investigate the entire flow and figure out why the WAF denied something that perhaps shouldn't have been. And all I can think now is that Microsoft is kind of crowdsourcing this this work so that they can train an AI model to do that in the future. Because mm. <laughs> that's clearly <laughs> so that now the ulterior motive of all Azure things now. Well, yeah. they're just using that to train a model. So. Yeah, yeah, it's gone from stoplights and buses to yeah. WAF events. <laughs> Uh, they are actually in the article uh, for Ryan's purpose. Uh, mm-hmm. There is quite a few walkthroughs of how you would use the notebook to basically do these different tasks. So they go they go through the use case of understanding the attack landscape when there's a true positive issue, to understanding when it's a false positive, and some of the persona involved in some of these processes and how you might use it. So there is some actionable stuff in the in the article uh, for if you really want to know. But uh, I did not include those in the show notes because it would take us forever to walk through them. I guess it's, I mean, my confusion really is like, you know, like you, you have a, you know, an exclusion, which is logged in your WAF and you have the policy that excluded that action, which makes sense, right? I, I, it's the next step where they're providing this, the notebook, um, you know, sort of, and I'm, maybe it's called notebook because it's similar to like sort of data science, machine learning type stuff, but I wasn't quite sure what that really did, even after reading the, uh, reading through the article. 
give it a shot and go by this. I think if I follow the step-by-step instructions, maybe I'll understand more. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a sort of security data splunking place. Yeah. Just as Jupyter mm-hmm. notebooks are. It's like, a, it's like an XDR type, um, you know, exercise in lab where they, you walk through the log hunting and threat hunting and how you do those different things. And, um, it, which was interesting the first time I did it because I was like, oh, I don't understand what they mean by threat hunting. Because <laughs> it's not really threat hunting. I mean, it is, but it's yeah. not how what not how you initially may react to the words threat and hunting put together yeah. in the same sentence. Uh, but it uh, it is interesting when you do those labs and understand what they're actually doing. It's it's kind of cool. Uh, I play Hollywood see, movies. It's part it's part of the security side of like that's the security part that I enjoy and would like to do and be fun and I should be a CISO and then. I remember all of the third-party risk and compliance and GRC side of security, and I lose interest again. So, <laughs> <laughs> Have you been waiting months and months to hire your new AWS, GCP, or Azure architect, only to have them be poached at the 11th hour by a startup with a juice bar? Initiatives stalled because you're having trouble hiring? Well, I have a simple solution. Falcon Consulting. Falcon Consulting provides top-notch cloud engineers to the world's most innovative companies and can be burning down your DevOps and cloud backlogs as soon as next week. Falcon certified AWS, GCP, and Azure professionals are armed with infrastructure as code and from day one will be designing performant, optimized cloud-native or hybrid environments that deliver on the promise of cloud. Their FogOps solution even provides on-demand cloud engineering to augment your existing teams. Visit www.foghornconsulting.com or send an email to cloudtalentnow at foghornconsulting.com and tell them the CloudPod sent you. Your dedicated FogOps team is with you for the long haul, and they bring their own juice. All right, well, we're, we're to Cloud Journey series, and our topic this week is migration techniques, <laughs> uh, which apparently you guys were not thrilled about last week because you didn't I, talk I, about it. Are you there? Are you, are you breaking up a bit? <laughs> oh, I'm breaking up a bit, huh? It's like I've lost the connection. Yeah. <laughs> Three grizzled veterans with jaded perspectives on yes. workloads talk about migration. There's only one correct answer in this list of ways to do it. But uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, see which one you think we think is the right way. <laughs> yeah, which way do you think we, we like the best? Um, so yeah, so last week we talked a lot about the six R thing. Uh, well, two weeks ago we talked about the six R's a little bit, and you know how you think about. From an application by application perspective, how you migrate them, you know, through the different process. Either you replace it with a SaaS product, or you migrate it, or you transform, lift and shift, or you transform and shift, uh, or you lift and transform. All these different ways you can kind of go through the process. But we didn't really talk about the underpinning mechanisms that actually exist inside of those type of things. And so there's really three: uh, hybrid migration, uh, cloud native migration, and a VMware migration. Uh, and so these are, you know, really capabilities that you could leverage to either accelerate or hinder your entire migration strategy. <laughs> so do choose wisely as you go through this process. Uh, but to kind of give you a brief understanding of each of them, so hybrid migration is typically where you you're going to keep some level of data gravity typically in your on-premise data center or in your co-location facility. Think like maybe my database is still going to live there, or maybe I'm going to have. Uh, you know, my legacy monolithic application that lives in that hybrid data center. Uh, and then all of my net new things, my new microservices, my new API gateways, all my new magic excitement thing will all be built cloud native. It'll live inside the cloud and it'll connect through an interconnect of some kind back to my monolith. Uh, and I'll use that technique to basically slowly strangle the monolith and replace all the functionality over time. And, you know, my migration will take five to seven years <laughs> as you go through a major transformation. Um, but it gets you, you know, it, it's a lower risk, uh, gets you to the cloud, you know, at least with new stuff faster, but doesn't typically solve some of your legacy challenges. The next one is a, a pure cloud native migration. This is, hey, I'm going to rewrite all of my deployment code, all of my automation. I'm going to do it in the cloud way. I'm going to take advantage of managed services. I'm going to do, uh, you know, all that work and I'm going to move the databases. I'm going to move the data gravity to the cloud and really take advantage of those managed services to really get to. You know the the secret sauce of migration, which is I want to be cheaper, faster, more innovative, and that's what you get through the cloud native migration path. And then the last one is VMware migration, which is how you take your tech debt and you just physically move it to the cloud by doing a vMotion from your on-premise data center uh, and to uh, to the cloud provider. Now that also can be through many other tools that the cloud providers provide as well. I just like to call it the VMware way because it's what people understand in the IT world. But this is also there's 
all kinds of migration utilities from all of the cloud providers, as well as numerous third parties that you can buy to basically take your existing image on premise and move it to the cloud and then spin it up either on a native instance or inside of a VMware container while garden that you have to maintain. Um, so those are really your three, your three main ways. And I miss anything on those three that I should have pointed out you to. Well, I mean, it's, it's all a journey. It's not, it's not just you choose this one thing and that's what you're stuck with forever. So, I mean, even in the case of VM migrations, I think if, if you're looking at having to sign a, a three or five year lease for some space in the data center, then if a VM migration gets you out of the door in two months and you transform from there, then, then that may be what you have to do economically. If you if you have if you have if you have a luxury, <laughs> then then the oh yeah, I mean this is just the migration portion for sure. I mean there's, I think there's always the question after the migration what you do. I mean this is just the how do I get there <laughs> part of the question. But yeah, I agree with you. There's always the part after the migration of like okay now that I've moved my VMware world to VMware world on top of AWS or GCP, how do I now get out of that walled garden? Because you're not going to get any of the benefits of cloud living in the walled garden. <laughs> Uh, or you're going to have to do VPC peering to connect all the managed services and other cloud native things you want. Um, but yeah, you, you always have to kind of figure out that next step. But really, this is about the purely about the migration piece of it, I think, um, and, and which of those three techniques you kind of take through the process. Um, you know, I, I think Amazon is very firmly in the camp of uh, cloud native is the way to go. <laughs> like you should redo all your applications and you should go through that process. Uh, whereas you know, I think hybrid came popular and what everyone wanted, and that's what you saw Azure. And GCP kind of embraces like, you don't have to move your whole workload. You can take advantage where it makes sense. And that then leads you into the multi-cloud story of like, then you can use the right cloud for the right workload and not cut us out the door when you sign a deal with AWS. <laughs> um, and so I think those are options. And then of course, VMware prefers you to do the third one because they get to continue to maintain revenue uh, on you <laughs> as you go through that process. Yeah, I mean, there's... It's it's funny because they, you know you come later to the game like Google and Azure did right you get to sort of capitalize on that and so like because that strategy of of you know like hybrid really is you know backed by the the Anthos you know sort of strategy and product right it's like oh well if you're containerized you can you can sort of do you can do this and Amazon has the outposts and the way to do similar type things but the reality is that the level of effort and transformation still has to happen there. It's just where the workload actually is physically located. That's different. Um, and so it's, it's sort of, there's pros and cons of, of all these things, but I think my biggest gripe is just like at a certain point, when do we not call that, that a migration? When do we, you know, start looking at these things, not as one thing. And, you know, like a, a, a hybrid migration isn't a migration if you're strangling your on-prem product or, you know, replacing it over time. It's, it's your software roadmap. Like this is the functionality we can get in this hosted place and we can get other functionality in this other hosted place. And this is, this is our feature delivery over the next several years. It's no longer a cloud migration. And that's, and I think that that's, you know, these migration projects end up getting sort of pigeonholed over time into things that they're not like with a finite end because of that. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause if you think about, the finance aspect of a migration, for instance, you know, it's going to take, you know, a hybrid migration, it's going to take five or seven years. That is going to really hurt your, the economics and the, the health of your business from a Wall Street perspective. But if you have a technology and innovation product roadmap, that makes a lot more sense, you know, as you, you can grow that over time and you can, you can change the sort of um, the story there and, and make an argument for, you know, the investments you're making in certain areas. And I just think that, you know, one of the, it's using the right terms for, for the projects that is, is important to, to sort of maintain that narrative. You're absolutely right. I think those terms have been chosen with a very infrastructure looking, um, eye in a way. Mm -hmm. Are we moving this infrastructure? We're we moving this infrastructure, but doing a bit of transformation. Uh, in the past, maybe maybe the cloud native one isn't isn't focused on infrastructure because it does encourage managed services, and those are things that we would like to. Well, we'd like to think that that those things will be adopted by you know product engineering rather than being bolt ons at, at deployment time by SRA teams or release teams. Often that's still not the case, though. I think in my ideal world, I, I've worked with so many legacy apps that have been around for twenty plus years. I really wonder why why goes the effort of this incremental, painful, slow transformation when you know your product at this point, you know your customers. I 
you have better tooling now than you did 20 years ago. You know, we're not talking about dot, the original .NET. We have amazing tools, amazing SDKs. Rewrite everything. Just spin up some some uh, some big ass project, and just rewrite your your, your uh, product to be cloud native from the ground up. That's that's that would be my ideal. Yeah, I think um, you know, kind of going to Ryan's point a little bit, what you were saying too. But you know, hybrid is not a; it shouldn't be seen as an evil thing. <laughs> I, I think because again, like you can move the legacy monolith, but what's the value of moving the monolith to the cloud if you're just going to strangle it and turn it into APIs and microservices? And and especially if there's no net new revenue for that investment, you're spending more money. Uh, to get to the cloud, to then basically spend more money and not get benefits until you finish the strangling. So if you can afford to continue to invest in your data center, it's not shutting down. <laughs> it makes sense to potentially leave it on-prem and then create new revenue opportunities with cloud that are cloud-native in their format up front, and take advantage of those things, and then you get the benefit of the cloud without having to make the huge bubble cost investment. And that does de-risk some of that, that story and I think that's, that's probably the biggest mistake I see people make in migration is they, they go down this path of, I have to move everything to the cloud because I'm not successful until the migration is completed. Um, and reality is, like, what are you really trying to get out of your migration for the business? Like, what are you, you're really just trying to not buy hardware anymore. <laughs> you, know, you can get your hardware on-premise the last five years, and if you think your transformation to a cloud-native, you know, monolithic to microservices thing is seven years, that's not that much hardware you have to buy. <laughs> and it makes sense to keep it on-prem and then leave it there. And you know, even in, in current days, like I talk about, you know, does it make sense to move SQL Server to cloud? <laughs> or does it make sense to create a data pop and leave it in my data center and make that a really high-functioning, robust application and just deal with the additional latency between the data center and the thing because we know we're eventually going to move to a data lake? And do I need to pay for both? Um, and those are, those are conversations you end up having a lot. And so I think that's why hybrid took off so well is because it didn't require you to do this major investment of moving and moving that for stable, mature applications that don't make, it doesn't grow more revenue by moving it. I think people often think though that they're not going to get any value from the migration until it's finished. Right. So we, we're not going to, we don't realize any benefits until we shut down the data center. And I, I think that's the wrong way of thinking about it. Well, I mean, I think a lot of companies end up in this this bubble cost concern, right? Where like, oh, well, we have this huge cost on data center and we have this huge cost on cloud and now it's impacting my margin of the business. Um, And because of that, that's why they want to rush because they want to get out of the bubble as quickly as possible. But um, again, I think this goes back to the conversation. Like, did you really need to do that if that product is going to go away in in three to four years? You know, three to four years on a, on a depreciation schedule and on a on a server health lifetime is not that bad. I kind of wish there was a way you could sell excess data center capacity. You know, as you're doing a migration, as you spin things down, but you've still got a commitment in a you know colo some ways. So it would be awesome to actually like kind of build a build an on-prem spot market type thing, so that you could actually <laughs> like, you know get some revenue back, get some compute back. Mm-hmm. Some cash back for uh, for the stuff you're not using to to realize that before you actually shut the whole thing down. That'd be neat. I would, yeah. That's maybe not a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> scratch that. Terrible idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. <laughs> yeah. My brain's thinking now. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I don't have anything else uh, on this topic unless you guys do. Um, I did for a second, but I think it's gone now. <laughs> Out of the three, though, which do you think are the most successful on average? And, and that, I guess it depends how you define success, but you know, a VM migration is simple. You, you move things from one place to another, maybe you move IP space, maybe you move some connectivity around, but it's simple and it's doable and it's achievable very quickly. Mm-hmm. I've seen plenty of failures in cloud-native migrations and in hybrid migrations. So it's, you know, Choose wisely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've never seen a successful VMware migration that wasn't DR, you know, yeah. like wasn't part of that. And so like it doesn't really get exercised. It goes through an evaluation and, and you know, like a lot of places test their DR. But it's, I think that even that, like from a financial perspective and probably from a security perspective and, and, and operational perspective over time, I think that has its own challenges um, and I've never really seen anyone do it or try it. I'm always curious to find someone who's like, yep, we took our entire 300 rack workload 
and moved it over, you know, like that's impressive. You know? Well, I mean, you can figure out real quickly that it's not cost effective <laughs> mm-hmm. when you're like VMware, please give me a proposal to move all of my on-prem 300 racks to cloud. And then I'll come back and say, well, that's going to cost you this much money. And you're like, Oh, that's a lot. <laughs> Never mind. So I think that's why you don't see a lot of successful versions of that <laughs> uh, because the price tag is pretty hefty. But um, I, you know, so my my preference is actually mostly hybrid migration at this point. I at one point in my career naively thought cloud native was the only way to do it. <laughs> it's the way I like to do it the best. But the reality is, for dealing with companies that are you know in some transitionary phase, like monolithic to microservices, uh, or moving into you know more digital transformation projects, stuff like that, the hybrid gives you the best of both worlds. I get to maintain a stable cost structure I understand, but I get to enable new innovation and new capabilities that are cloud ready from day one. And I think ultimately that's the reason why hybrid took off is in the market too, is because of that exact reason. And so, you know, if if the monolith is going to live on forever, then you know, maybe you want to make the move, but you can make the move much more slowly uh, because you're still getting value out of the cloud investment. You're still getting access to things that you want, you're getting that elasticity, you're getting that burstable capacity. That's all really important. Uh, and that's one of the big reasons why you want a cloud was for those things, right? So if I'm a retailer and I have a pretty fixed um, workload that I run most of the time, I can keep that on premise. It's a, I know it, it's cheap, but I do know at Black Friday, I need four times the capacity and I only need it for Black Friday. And then I can use this hybrid configuration to basically scale up into a cloud and burst. That's a really compelling use case and really the right optimization of I have I have a pretty steady workload most of the year, and I have a really spiky workload this one period of time. And I'm going to take advantage of that opportunity with cloud. It really it really is, is is like a parallel to agile. I mean, sure you have these old waterfall processes, and you, you don't get anything for for six months or twelve months if you're lucky, and with nothing to show in the middle. And with agile, every two weeks or three weeks, you're shipping features, and you're seeing benefits from the work you put in immediately. And I guess the hybrid migration model lets you realize the benefits of cloud incrementally as you go. And then a lot of it's the framing, right? Like if it's, you know, you can still make investments on your on-prem workloads. You can innovate on your on-prem workloads. You can manage that more efficiently and you can still invest there if you don't frame the thing as, oh, we're getting out of here. So everything I dump into here, into my on-prem workloads is, is you know, waste because we're going to have to throw it away as we do these things. Like if you, if you're realistic about these things, like it's, you can actually get the best of both worlds. You'll make your on-prem workloads better by investing where it makes sense there as well. Great. Well, that's it for another fantastic week here in the cloud. I will see you all next week. All right. See you later. Bye, everybody. And that is The Week in Cloud. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Foghorn Consulting. Subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and tweet us your feedback at hashtag the cloud pod or join our Slack channel. Go to our website, thecloudpod.net for sign up instructions. Uh, so uh, basically, there was an article, uh, and it was written by a Stanford professor who studied organizational behavior for decades. And he says the widespread layoffs in tech are more because of copycat behavior than necessary cost cutting. Uh, and this is all, you know, basically, he studies organizations, he goes through this process. He said hiring is fundamentally expensive, paying recruiters, hunt headers, sign on bonus, et cetera, and firing is just as expensive as that hiring process is. And this process is just nat- naturally so cool. Uh, so companies are trying to justify the layoffs due to cost cutting, but the reality is that they're not going to run out of money if they do lay off or don't lay off in most cases, which we're seeing, which is a company lays off 500 people, then they have record profits <laughs> and their margin grew in the quarter. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's sort of interesting. And then, you know, it also calls out in the article, the irony is that these companies a year ago were talking about how important the people are to their business and what a capital asset their people are. Uh, and now just turn around and throwing them to the curb. So, yeah, really an interesting uh, article and, and take on it. And you know, it does feel very much like it's everyone copying everyone else because that's what Wall Street wants, not because they feel they really have to. It would be interesting. I know there's the website that tracks layoffs. It would be really interesting to look at the, the difference in proportions of layoffs between publicly traded companies and privately held companies. Because, oh, yeah. because I, think, I think that just the nature of the capitalist economy Drives a lot of these decisions because if you if you have big if you have mass investors getting on calls at the end of every quarter, and this and this particular company has just um, laid off twenty thousand staff to improve their profit margins and this one has not, who are you going to go with? Who's who's most likely to to have you know to bring the highest dividends or the best growth? Um, 
I think it's a bit of a narrow-minded approach. Best growth financially doesn't necessarily mean best growth for the future. But yes, I can definitely see, I mean, when, when companies post billions and billions of dollars in, in profits, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to take the necessity to, to lay off workers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially when you hear those reports that, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, we, you know, due to the, the harsh economic conditions, we're, we're letting all these people go. Oh, yeah, we also hired Matthew McConaughey for $10 billion to be our creative expert. You know, like, and it's just like, okay, so that's just a lie. <laughs> you know? Yeah, all, all the Super Bowl ads and things like that. You yeah, spent yeah. how many million dollars on 30 second ad? <laughs> yeah, like, it's just like, uh, yeah, no, no. <laughs> This doesn't feel like a real financial decision. This feels it 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 feels like there's some other intent, right? Like it's I don't you know, and it's it, this would make sense to explain that. Yeah, the, the cynic in me kind of it kind of makes me think that it's. I'm not necessarily saying there's collusion between these companies to to drive the cost of labor down, but it's easy to see that with so many layoffs, what are we up to? A couple hundred thousand layoffs. Oh, let me go check out the layoff tracker. Hold on. (laughs) Easy to see that with so many layoffs, the the demand for labor has changed and it is no longer an employee's market. Yeah, it's uh, 128,202 layoffs as of a recording here. Well, but the job growth numbers are still very strong, like as a nation. Which is true, you know. Which is interesting as well, in the U.S. anyway. Yeah. Well, and I think that's because during the pandemic. You know, labor was impossible to get. You couldn't find people for most of the roles mm-hmm. you had open. So there was the haves and have nots of hiring, right? Fang companies mm-hmm. hired like crazy. They were able to get people all day long. And then smaller and mid-sized companies or even smaller enterprise companies were not able to hire at the level they needed to. And so they were sitting on open wrecks. And so I think what you're seeing is just these people are getting laid off from Fang. And then as long as they're capable of doing the jobs, they're now all of a sudden have a job in a smaller company where they actually may have more impact. Mm-hmm. Um, because again, like a lower performer at a fang company is not the same as a low performer at a small business. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to link to the the TikTok video I saw earlier, but I, I had a very very good rant earlier about this entire situation about these copycat layoffs and and how employees were sort of unfairly penalized and they've lost their jobs because they were poorly utilized, not because they were poorly performing. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Yeah. No, it's you know. What was the, yeah, Benioff, you know, talking about all the new hires being less effective, you know, f- from the pandemic and, you know, like it, it, it makes it, it makes it geared towards like the, the employee's fault when really it's a business didn't really know how to, how to operate during a pandemic in a remote first yeah. world. Right. And it's just like, that's not them not being able, you know, it's them not being supported or getting access to the resources they needed. It's not them being lazy and just like, oh, I just all watch TV all day and put my mouse on one of those auto clickers or whatever. So, you know, like it's dumb. I hate it. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't help all the, the things you read in the in media around, well, well, this tech person's got 16 jobs and they, they just check in like once, once a week with, mm-hmm. with their boss and they're making $1.3 million a year or something. Yeah. I, th- I think that just gives people a bad image. I, you know, it's just like, yeah. uh, you know, every, every homeless person's just looking for drugs or yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it just wants to drink the next, uh, whatever. That's, yeah. yeah. I'm sure that there is one person who had 16 terrible bosses who, who basically allowed them to get away with murder and didn't check in and, and wasn't measuring performance in any meaningful way. And then that turns into a thing that's repeated. And then the internet is a huge magnifier of that noise. And, mm-hmm. and now it's like every single person who's decided to become remote has 16 jobs and it isn't really putting in their full effort and is quiet quitting. You know, like it's like, I hate, I hate all the narrative. Yeah. Quiet quitting, quiet firing, all these words. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Remember when we expected our leaders to be, you know, like generate excitement and passion and, and those mm-hmm. things. And now it's just like, no, that people suck. I'm like, eh. <laughs> maybe it's you. you know? <laughs> like, yeah, the the whole you know it, this is interesting. You know, you brought up the quiet quitting thing, but the the quiet firing I sort of find interesting because it's it basically describes that managers fail to adequately provide coaching, support, and career development to an employee, which results in pushing the employee out of an organization. I don't know. That I call that firing as much mm-hmm. as just you know they don't have a spot for you to move up, or they don't. You have a bad manager. <laughs> you know, it's really less about you know an intentful thing. It's it's a fact. Of the matter is, is that just have bad boss. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, you know, we had bad bosses before there was the challenge of remote work, exactly. right? When, 
you had physical proximity it as an advantage to, to check in on someone and and your physical proximity and, forced you to be able to go sit in your manager's office like hey i need us i need something or i need feedback yeah. or you, know, you can yeah, force yeah. those things where it's a little harder to like schedule time on someone's calendar who's booked from 7 a.m until 6 p.m every day yeah. so <laughs> like it's yeah it's you know we we're having to adapt and make new ways of working and 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 that you know, is going to be a little disruptive. And I think that if anything, the pandemic and the productivity levels showed that despite all of that, we were doing an amazing job. So, you know, it's, if there are individuals there that aren't performing, like, yeah, it's much easier. There's, there's many more excuses now. There's many more ways we can blame employees for, for, for problems. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, guys, well, thanks guys. I, it was a good article and uh, thanks for your insights as well, but uh, see you next week. Awesome. See you.